Pasamos a la siguiente ponencia que tiene como epígrafe de jurisprudencia del TAS sobre derecho del fútbol de 2017 a 2019. Nuestro ponente es considerado uno de los árbitros con más experiencia en el TAS, es además codirector del programa de Derecho de Fútbol de la UEFA y presidente de la Asociación Suiza de Derecho Deportivo. Hablamos de Michele Bernasconi. Adelante. Muchas gracias. Well, thank God I don't have the same tie as, la as two years ago, otherwise uh, people would think I have only one tie. Um, it is a huge pleasure to be here. I have uh, to say a big thank you to the Royal Federación Española de Football. Uh, every two years it's fantastic to be back in Madrid and it's fantastic to work with the colleagues of the organizing committee, Emilio, Miguel and Marta, so I'm extremely happy to be here. Uh, I know that it comes like a bit in a restaurant where you get always the same kind of uh, amuse-bouche or the same kind of uh, limoncello at the end of the, of the dinner. I come up with some jurisprudence and some cases. Well, uh, to start with, uh, it would be nice if the PowerPoint presentation will work again, otherwise it's really difficult. Thank you some introductory remarks. First, Uh, this is only the first part of the jurisprudence. My good friend, uh, Professor Abreu, will talk this afternoon at 3 o'clock about minors and other matters. Second, uh, all decisions that I will discuss today uh, are either published on the CAS website or on the CAS bulletin or on the FIFA website or will be published very soon. Third, and this is very important, When I do this, when I prepare this presentation, I always try to find cases that are interesting for the public. And of course, I try to summarize the cases in a little bit in an easy way, maybe also sometimes a little bit funny. And I'm, of course, I'm therefore deviating from what was the real story of the case. Since many of the cases I will speak about have been dealt with by people that are in the room, be it as CAS arbitrators or ad hoc clerks or lawyers, don't feel offended if I make a comment. These comments are of general nature and have nothing to do with the real case. I try to take out of the general case, out of the specific case some general remarks. This is important because I don't want people to be offended or to believe that I, I take some freedom that is not absolutely the intention. Now, let's start. Yes. Michele Bernasconi means he can always speak about Article 17 of the RSTP. And sooner or later, I think Emilio will change the numbering of the rules so that I can speak about another article. But today we are speaking not about 17.1, so it's not about the breach itself, it's about 72, which is the several joint liability of the new club. Uh, just to remind us what are the rules, 17.1, in case of unilateral termination without just cause, the party that terminates the agreement like this has to pay compensation, so the breach has to be compensated. This is easy. We discussed that case many times. Now, 17.2 says, if a player must pay compensation for breach, his new club is joint and several liable for the payment. Now, Why this rule has been introduced, just to think about it, because by this, the idea was that the, the victim, the club that has been left by the, by the athlete, receive quicker the money that, is, that the club is supposed to receive. So this is basically the rationale. Now, what is the first case? What is this case about? It's about a player from Ghana, Uh, Mr. Azil Abdul, who has a three years contract with a Ghana club called Azante Kotoko. Normal agreement, fine, he's playing in that club in Ghana. Now, at a certain point of time, mid of July 2014, there is an Egyptian club, Ismaili, that sends an offer, actually sends two offers, here yeah, I make simple one offer, but basically sends two offers, same day, both to the player, to Abdul, and to uh, Azante Kotoko. So we have the Ghana club and the Ghana player receiving this offer from Egypt. 
And what happens? Basically the same day, both the club and the player accept the offer made by Ismaili. So we have an offer of a new employment agreement to the player, an offer for the transfer fee to the club, and the acceptance by the club and by the player of these two agreements. Now, of course, if everything goes well, we will not speak about this case. Just two weeks afterwards, 1st August, Azante Kotoko accepts another offer, an, an offer from another Egyptian club called Smuha, and the player as well. We don't know exactly if we read the, if we read the decision when this offer was made. It is probably that the offer was made either on August 1st or July 30th. So basically the same day. And now you can imagine what happens. The player, of course, joins Zmuha, and there is one party who is not happy. And that party is, of course, Ismaili. And Ismaili, the other Egyptian club, the club that sent first the offer, files three claims against the Zmuha club, or the club where now the player is playing, against the player and against Kotoko. What happens now? It happens that the FIFA DRC uh, decides that the player has to pay a contribution, a compensation for the damage caused to Ismaili, and that Smua is jointly liable to pay that compensation. And then, of course, both are not happy. Well, who is happy is Kotoko, because the Canal crop, according to the DRC decision, does not have to pay anything. At least we have, at this point of time, an happy party. Well, the dispute is obviously that the player and Smuha do not want to pay any contribution, any compensation to Ismaili, and therefore they come to CAS and file an appeal. What decides CAS? First, and this is important, even though maybe the rules will be different one day, I don't know, we will hear a little bit maybe tomorrow, today and tomorrow about that, but for the time being, CAS, also referring to a quite important decision of the Tribunal Federal, of the Swiss Tribunal Federal, said this system of joint liability is by itself justified, is by itself uh, legitimate. Why? Because, frankly, even if we forget one moment that we are a sports lawyer, even in other situations, in other contracts, in life, it is quite normal that if a party helps another party or induces another party to breach an agreement and this party is taking some profit out of it, well, then the injured party, of course, can try to go against both of us. And this is the idea behind the system. The idea behind the system is that the new club is joint and several liable because the new club has the player, so he has a profit out of the breach of the agreement. And this is why, according to the rules and according to the jurisprudence of both CAS and the Tribunal Federal and also FIFA, the joint and several liability of the new club does not require a fault by the new club. And this is why I know in some situations the situation, the status for the new club may be complicated. And since it is sometimes complicated, I like very much a passus, a part of this decision of CAS, where the panel says, this is all true. There is no fault requirement. However, maybe some justification is necessary to make indeed the new club joint and solidarily responsible. In particular, going now to the case, Smuha, the second club, the second Egyptian club, well, they did not profit for the breach of the player. Why? Because they made simply an offer to a club, they received an acceptance, they paid the transfer fee, and they received the player. They did not profit of a player leaving the country and going by himself and deciding, I breach a contract and I sign a new agreement. They were behaving properly, and according to the facts, as 
they were before CAS and before FIFA, Smua did not know about the offer of Ismaili. <coughs> Therefore, without profit, why should the new club be joint and several responsible? So, in, Smua was not aware of the accepted offer, and in addition, the panel looks also at the fact that in this particular case, Ismaili was not able to prove that they suffered the damage. It is true, they sent an offer, and it's true, the other parties, the club and the player, accepted. But then the player did not go there, they did not spend one penny, they did not pay one salary to the other club. So they are not really in the position, like they say, say the normal injured club, that see a player leaving and breaching the agreement. <coughs> so, as last point, also interesting, in a normal se Article 17 case, when the new club has to pay the old club, well, in that situation, the new club may have, under employment law, a possibility to ask the player to be reimbursed. Frankly, I never saw a football player paying one coffee and one agent fee or one something. So I don't think this is real, real possible, but at least in theory it is. In this case, SMU has not this possibility. Why? Because in another separate decision, FIFA confirmed by CAS confirmed that the player did not breach the agreement with uh, Ismaili. <coughs> Therefore, to conclude, the key takeaway of this quite interesting case, well, the principle that a new club is automatically, without fault, joint and several liable remains valid. That means if a player breaches an agreement, it is quite, let's say, dangerous, complicated to be the new club. However, there may be some exceptions. First, the one of this case, if the new club did not do anything wrong, was not even aware of the breach, and was not enriched, did not take any profit through the breach by the breach of the player, and in addition could not claim even reimbursement by the player, then this speaks rather in favor of not joint liability by that club. And then there are two other exceptions in CAS jurisprudence going back two and three years ago. The one was the case of the French player La Sana Diara and Lokomotiv Moscow. There, the player, after breaching the agreement, did not sign a new agreement. And therefore, there was no new club in the sense, in the meaning of Article 17, Paragraph 2. And then the third and, at the moment, last exception, if it was the employer decision that the player must leave, then, of course, it is difficult for that employer to claim the joint responsibility, liability from the new club. This was the case of Chelsea and Mutu, and going back to the claim of Chelsea against Juventus, rejected by CAS on this basis. This is for the first case, Article 17. Now let's move to something which has been a little bit part of one of the questions, denial of justice and standing to appeal uh, after a subject substantive case. Now let's try to look one at one a little bit of procedural nature. What is this case about? Two important clubs, uh, Fenerbahce on one side and Trapp Sponsor on the other side. In the season 2010 and 2011 of the Turkish League, uh, Fenerbahce won the title and Trapp Sponsor is second. What happens? In July, several persons were arrested because of uh, match fixing and, and the like, white, white uh, investigation. What happens afterwards, two years afterwards, with a decision to sanction Fenerbahce with the exclusion two years from the European club competitions. Um, this case went to CAS. CAS confirmed the decision in August 2013. This is simply the starting point. Now, of course, we know at this point of time that Fenerbahce has been sanctioned and the decision of CAS is final and therefore Fenerbahce is indeed excluded from the Champions League or the Europa League. Well, since Transponsport was, uh, was second in that championship, 
they file a complaint, actually they file several complaints. What we look here is the complaint that they file with FIFA uh, against Fenerbahce and the Turkish Football Federation in July 17. What happens afterwards? The first FIFA letter. The first FIFA answer, uh, the, bit, the part which is most important for us, is this sentence uh, sent on 5th of February 2018. For once, I am very bad in deadlines. Let's try all of us to keep 5 February 18 for one moment in our mind. You will see this is a little bit important. FIFA basically say, we analyzed the files, we looked at the documents, this sentence is quite important. We analyze the document, and we hereby inform you that the FIFA Disciplinary Committee is not in a position to intervene in the present matter. Then, of course, the usual sentence you receive from FIFA, this is only of informatory nature, this is not, say, this is not a decision, and blah, blah, blah. But basically, this was the important part of the sentence. What happens next? Of course, the sponsor is not happy, its fans even less. What happens? The club sends further letters to FIFA, several, basically to the disciplinary committee, to the ethics committee, to the secretary general, I don't know. Well, in April 2018, therefore, more than two months after the, five, the letter number one, the letter number two is sent. Here, the important sentence. We would like to draw your attention to the content of the letter dated 5 February and reiterate that the FIFA Disco is not in a position to intervene and therefore is not in a position to render a decision in the present matter. Again, this letter is only of informative nature, is only abstract, blah, 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 it's not a decision. Good. What happens next? Yes, Transponsor sends again some letters and in particular he files an appeal against the letter number two of FIFA. And what happens? The FIFA letter number three is the letter of the deputy secretary of the FIFA uh, appeal committee. Please be informed that as you do not appear to fulfill the requirements to lodge an appeal before the FIFA appeal committee, uh, the FIFA appeal committee and the FIFA disciplinary commission is not in position to intervene in this case in which the FIFA disco has no jurisdiction and therefore your request cannot be accepted. Finally, at this point of time, the lawyers of Transponsor decide to stop sending letters to FIFA and they start sending, well, they already started sending emails to several email accounts of CAS, but this was a, on another kind of way, but now finally they file an appeal to CAS. And the issue here, uh, the issue that are of importance for us is that Transponsor files a statement of appeal against letter number two and letter number three and the, the appeal does simply request, or basically uh, goes against the fact that FIFA refused to take a decision. So they claim there is a denial of justice by FIFA by rejecting to take a decision. And so the first question we have is a question that goes back to actually probably the first, the first Congress here we had are these two letters appealable decision? And did FIFA deny justice to Trap Sponsor? What does the panel decide on these two issues? First, appealable decision. The CAS confirms the, I would say now, stable jurisprudence of CAS that in principle for a communication, a letter, an email, fax do not, are not sent anymore but any kind of communication to be a decision, this decision must contain a ruling, meaning the body that issues that decision intends to change, affect, have an impact on the legal status of the person receiving the communication. Where this communication is called letter, communication or decision is absolutely irrelevant. Second point, any decision of a federation, association and so on, is normally a decision if it is directed with a certain, to the, to the party that receives the decision with the animus decidendi. In other words, if the body sending that communication has a willingness, a wish to decide on the matter that is posed on, the, on that body. And therefore, based on this, the letter number one, the letter which is not appealed to Cass, 
the letter that has been sent on February 5th and has never been subject of an appeal actually was a decision because already in the letter number one, FIFA, sorry, FIFA informs uh, Transponsor, we are not dealing in this matter. We reject your request to do something in this matter. And therefore the CAS panel says, Transponsor should have filed an appeal with CAS already against that letter. Now, is this the end of the game? It could have been. CAS could have said, so we are very sorry, you did not go against the first decision, now it's too late, say this, and therefore, goodbye. However, CAS was here, I would say, properly fair, but also correct in saying that, well, do we have two other decisions of FIFA? So FIFA basically came back to its position and issued two other decisions, which are letter number two and number three. And these letters have been filed, the appeal have been filed in time, because in this letter, FIFA cons confirms that they don't have jurisdiction and that they don't want to accept the request of Transponsor. Therefore, the decision is appealable, even though, and this is important for the practitioner among us, in the, in the future, Transponsor and another party in the same position should file, of course, an appeal against Lambert number one, because it is not necessarily always the case that FIFA will issue a letter number two or a letter number three. So letters two and three are also considered decision, and now, therefore, the issue that FIFA deny justice should be rejected. Why? Because Transposor now received three times, three answers about its request. The request is, we do not want to accept your, this, your request. And therefore, to speak about denial of justice simply because FIFA does not accept your request is not a valid point. This is important, maybe goes back to the question that was made before. Denial of justice, therefore, means that really the person asking the federation, the association, to do something does not receive any answer. But a negative answer, or here even three negative answers, cannot be considered a denial of justice. So the appeal is considered possible or admissible, but is rejected because it is in the merits without grounds. Again, be careful. The appeal here only requested CAS to determine that FIFA had denied justice. The appeal did not request FIFA, uh, a CAS to decide that FIFA should open a procedure or whatever. So the issue at stake was very limited to the question, did FIFA deny justice or not? I hope this is clear, because even more complex is the second issue. The second issue is the standing of appeal. Does Transponsor actually have standing to appeal against these letters of FIFA? Well, the principle we know, but let's repeat it. You have standing to appeal against the decision if you have a direct personal and actual interest in doing something against that decision. If you want to do something only because you have time to do it, but you, are not ever, you don't have a real interest, well, you don't have standing of appeal. So you must be sufficiently affected by a decision. You cannot file an appeal if the decision does not affect you at all. And therefore, this affect means a financial or a sporting interest at stake that is, has an impact about the decision, the decision has an impact about this interest. And here, in this case, where the CAS panel says, well, Transponsor actually does not have standing to appeal here. Why? Because they, they want FIFA and the uh, Turkish Federation to start an investigation, but as a club, they don't have a right to request such an investigation to take place. They have the right to send letters and inform FIFA or the Turkish Football Federation that something wrong has been done, but they don't have a right, they are not entitled to request that a procedure really start. And therefore, they cannot uh, file an appeal if this procedure is, the, if this opening of investigation is rejected. So it is different here, and this is quite important, even though 
I am also not an early bird, and we are in Spain, it's 11 something, and so it's still early in the morning, coffee break to come. But it's important to keep in mind that there is a difference between the right to file a complaint to a federation, to an ethics commission, to an association, whatever, and the right to obtain a decision. It is not the same. So here there is, uh, in addition, one point. Even admitting that Transponsor had the right to request FIFA to do something, but there are several possible sanctions that can be imposed on Transponsor, like, for example, a fine, a warning, and it is not necessarily so that a sanction would mean that, that the, sorry, sanctions against Fenerbahce, obviously. So if Fenerbahce is sanctioned, this does not mean automatically that Trump sponsor wins the title since they come from second to first. And therefore, even this shows a lack of standing of appeal by the Turkish club. Key takeaway, well, if First point, and I, I know that uh, this may not make a lot of joy to the several friends working in FIFA legal department that are here today. Well, even if FIFA writes on a letter, this is only of an informative nature, this is not a decision, etc. well, this can nevertheless be an appealable decision. You have to look at the substance of the letter and not at this final sentence. A rejection of jurisdiction, a rejection of admissibility about a complaint can be appealable decisions. And standing to appeal, just to conclude, although every decision affecting a competitor may have a somehow impact on another competitor, well, this does not mean that you have a standing to appeal. Third case, again, if there are two topics that you cannot leave this room if I'm speaking is one Article 17 and training compensation. Training compensation is a matter that in, I consider quite complicated and this is why I think it's always interesting to see every two years we think we know everything and then all of a sudden there are new cases and new cast decisions that bring us closer to maybe the final answer. <coughs> now this case is about a Senegal player Pape Moussa Konate. Uh, he plays first two years in uh, Israel in, with Maccabi Tel Aviv. Then he joins Krasnodar, a Russian club. Then he goes on loan to Genoa, an Italian club, as you probably know. He goes back to Krasnodar at the end of the loan, basically a couple of days. Basically, he, for sure, he doesn't go back to Russia. He goes back on the paper to Krasnodar while only on the paper, because almost at the same day, literally a few days afterwards, the players transferred to F Session, uh, a Swiss team. Now here, therefore, is important, let's, let's look at the colors. I try to, to, to help myself. Yellow are transfer, and, and gray are transfer on loan. So the players transfer from Maccabi to Krasnodar, on loan to Genoa, Back to, back to Krasnodar and then in loan, uh, sorry, and then in transfer to F Session. Why is tra training compensation here a topic? Well, because afterwards, the player is transferred from the Swiss club F Session to a French club, sport club Amiens. Good, then what happens? It happens that Genoa files a claim for training compensation against F Session. Now, why we have a dispute here? The relevant rules, just recap very quickly, at least the current relevant rules, Article 20, and then all the details in of Annex 4. Training compensation is due when the player is registered for the first time as professional. This is not important here today for this case. Or a player is transferred between clubs of two different national associations before the end of the season of his 23rd birthday. In this case, payment is only due to the former club. So if in the first case, which is not important here, payments are due to all the clubs, in this second case, in case of a transfer, 
from a professional to one club to the other, normally we have what we call the segmentation principle. You have to pay only to the previous club. So here, if we have four clubs, A, B, C, and D, three normal transfer, D will have to pay to C, C will, pay, will have to pay to B, and B to A. This is the standard case under the FIFA rules. But in our case, here is a little bit difficult because we have this loan and because we have Genoa asking money from Sion. And Sion said, one moment, I, I, sorry, I acquired the services of the player from Krasnodar, not from you. I don't know you, Genoa. Of course, the lawyer of, of FC Sion knows very well the lawyer of Genoa, but the lawyer said, I, who are you? We, we, are, we, are, we, are, we were dealing with Krasnodar. If you have something, go to Krasnodar. Because look at the rules, the former club is Krasnodar. So this is basically the position of FC Sion. Go ask money to, from Krasnodar if you think, because we personally, we believe we don't have to pay. And they have a point. Because in Article 10 of the regulation, it is said that loans are treated as transfer. So the transfer between Krasnodar and Genoa is the transfer one, but the transfer Krasnodar Sion is transfer number two. So in a way, they have a point. Genoa, who probably attended this conference two years ago, remembered that there was a cast decision after a couple of cast decisions going a little bit like a slalom right and left that finally settled this point. That is, a loan, a, a, a period of loan of a player of a club does not interrupt the training period of the player with the club that is the club on a permanent basis of the player. What does this mean? At the end, it does mean that Genoa is right. In other words, in such a situation, when we have first a transfer for good, like here from a club one to two, then a transfer two to three in loan, the return to the loan does not con is not considered to be a, a end of the segmentation period. The club two then will transfer the player to the club four, and the club four is the FC Sion. In this particular situation, at the beginning, is easy. Krasnodar has to pay training compensation to Maccabi Tel Aviv, but Sion has to pay first to to Krasnodar and also to Genoa. Because Genoa has trained a player, the player was in loan. Of course, for this part of the period, so the period that the player was in loan at Genoa, Krasnodar does not get the money. So it's not that Krasnodar gets money and then for the same period of time, Sion has to pay twice. That would be wrong. No, Sion has to pay for the period of time that the player was in loan in Genoa to Genoa, and for the period of time the player was at Krasnodar, really playing for Krasnodar to Krasnodar. And this is because the player came back to Krasnodar but was immediately transferred back to FC Sion. Does this clarify everything? I don't know. Um, will the new rules uh, find a better solution of all of this? Also, I don't know. For sure, the panel confirmed Genoa's position, and therefore, the key, away, the key takeaway of this case can be summarized as follows. These are my personal rules. I don't know if they are entirely correct, but this is what I learned from this case. Once a professional, for any subsequent transfer, uh, training, the general rules apply that training compensation is due only to the former club. Well, this is true if the player has been effectively trained, basically, he played for that former club. But a club should not be compensated for training that has taken place elsewhere. So Krasnodar cannot ask for training compensation from FC Sion for the time the player was in loan at Genoa. And this means that, for example, therefore, that the loan of a player to another club does not interrupt, does not create a segmentation period. Therefore, the, the training period at Genoa can be asked to the finally new club after the end of the permanent period of the player with, in our case, Krasnodar. 
So the club that loans a player can request compensation only for the time he effectively trained the player, but not the time that the player was in loan. I hope this clarifies. In other words, the last, the last sentence again, if the re, after the return of a loan, the player goes automatically, basically, without playing any season with the principal club, then the new club, in our case, F Session, has to pay both the club that gave the player in loan and the club that had the player in loan. And this is why F Session lost the case and had to pay both to Genoa and Krasnodar. The case at Cas was only be between Sion and Genoa. I don't know by reading the case if Krasnodar ever asked money from FC Sion. I hope this is clear. Happy to answer questions afterwards. Uh, for me, it is interesting. I remember two years ago when discussing the matter of loan. This was one of the uh, issues that were discussed during the coffee break afterwards. So I'm happy that we have this case that was, decision was issued a few months ago. Another important topic is failure to respect decisions. It's important because first is important, is one of the basis of the functioning of dispute resolution in sport. And it's also important because we have a quite interesting development of the FIFA code um, uh, in these few months. So let's look first at the relevant rule. If we look at Article 64 of the old FIFA disciplinary code, Article 64 says, or said, anyone who fails to pay another person a certain amount of money, even though it has been directed by a body of FIFA or by a CAS appeal decision, to do so can be sanctioned. Sanction can be fine, deduction of points, relegation, blah, blah, blah. Now, as probably many of you know, uh, since uh, basically two months, we uh, entered into force on 15 July 2019. The, the disciplinary code has been totally rewritten by the new FIFA disciplinary team and legal team. And in particular, Article 64 is now Article 15. And if you look very quickly, it looks exactly the same. But thank God there is uh, someone who kept, kept a promise, that is Mr. Garcia Emilio. Uh, he was not entirely happy years ago when Article 64 was amended and the appealable, sorry, the enforceable decision of CAS were only those subsequent CAS appeal decision. So FIFA was not anymore active as enforcing partner, partner, I would say, in case of CAS ordinary case or in case of other CAS decision not going back to a previous FIFA case. If you look carefully, the second, the wording of Article 15 is different. It is any decision of a committee or an instance of FIFA or CAS. It is not anymore a requirement that you go first to FIFA. This is quite important, in particular for those cases, like at least under the current agent regime, you don't have a jurisdiction of FIFA for some matters, and you decide in your agreement to foresee a competence of CAS. Uh, I assume that CAS will be happy, therefore, to offer its services in these cases where you go to CAS in trying to enforce a previous CAS decision. Or if you go to FIFA, trying to enforce the discipline by disciplinary measure a previously decision rendered by the CAS. And now let's look at the, at the case we have here, which is a quite interesting case. It's a, in one, in one sense we can say a typical case. We have a player, Luis Fernando da Silva, I believe he's called Oso Fernandinho in Brazil. He files a claim against Al Jazeera, a club from Abu Dhabi. And uh, we have the FIFA DRSA decision which is quite clear, yes, the club must pay 600,000 euro. Basically, salary, bonuses, and blah, blah. Easy, easy starting point. What happens? Of course, I said it's a quite standard case. Nothing happens. Uh, no payment is done. And therefore, uh, Al Jazeera goes to FIFA, uh, pardon, to CAS, because they're not happy with the decision of FIFA. They, want, they don't want to pay anything to the player. The CAS case uh, become, is closed basically because 
<coughs> not in the merits. There is no decision saying whether the FIFA DRC decision was right or wrong. I believe simply because Al Jazeera did not pay the amount to be paid. Anyway, the DRC decision becomes res judicata, and what happens? It happens that the player wants his money, but Al Jazeera is still not paying, and therefore the player goes to FIFA and asks disciplinary measure to be imposed on uh, Al Jazeera club. In March 2018, the FIFA player status, as a first thing, grants a deadline to the club. You have now X days, I believe 30 or 60, to pay finally this amount, otherwise disciplinary sanctions may be imposed. What happens? Obviously nothing. Uh, the no money is paid and therefore FIFA opens disciplinary procedures against the club. And as you may know, the first step when disciplinary proceedings are opened, this opening is communicated to the club and FIFA offers a last reminder, a last deadline. You now have really have to pay, otherwise we will indeed take disciplinary measures against you. What happens? Nothing again. The payment is not done, and therefore this is why the FIFA Disciplinary Committee issues its decision, and uh, there are a lot of fines, deductions, blah, 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 we will see later in detail. Of course, what does the club? The club goes again to CAS, filing an appeal against the second FIFA decision, the decision of the FIFA Disciplinary Committee. Now, until now, it is uh, quite a simple case because it's a case that uh, many of you have seen many times. What is interesting is uh, here it is quite clear that the club violated Article 64. Why? Because the club itself does not question the fact that according to the first cast decision, he, uh, the club had to pay 600,000 to the player. What the club's claims with CAS is simply that this fine of 25,000 is too much, is absolutely uh, excessive. And, well, the, the, the decision of, of, of FIFA, which is appealed, does not only contain the fine of 25,000, the decision also contains a final deadline of 60 days to pay to the player. So it is actually the third reminder in, granted by FIFA they say, you have now 60 days. The fine you have to pay. 25,000 you have to pay. But you have now 60 days to pay the 600,000. If you pay the, within 60 days, you will have only to pay the fine. Otherwise, deduction of points. And what? Six points deducted? Plus, if you don't pay within these 60 days, <coughs> we will impose a ban to register players for two consecutive transfer periods. And... Also, if you will continue not to pay, we may decide even on a possible relegation of the club. So the appeal at CAS is now, is now confronted to the question whether this decision is acceptable or not in accordance to the rule. What, decide, uh, what, the, what says the, the panel? The panel first starts to say, well, first a moment, we take notice that the club does not dispute to owe 600,000 to the player. So the failure to respect a decision of FIFA is undisputed. <coughs> Third, they look at the fine. Well, the fine is roughly 4% or even less of the amount which is due. And the amount which is due is quite important to determine how big, how strong the fine can be. In other words, if you if the club would owe only, let's say, 10,000 to a player, you cannot impose a fine of 25,000. But if the club owes 600,000 and the fine is 4%, this is absolutely uh, uh, not excessive. Indeed, there are other cases of CAS where even a fine which is 4.8, I believe, or 4.7 has been considered absolutely acceptable. So this point, dear club, frankly, is not relevant. And then the panel looked also at the fact that during, the, during basically this dispute, the club was not trying to work hard to save money. No, they were acquiring new players, paying new transfer fees here, one million there, and so on. So how, why you don't pay 600,000 that you owe to a player, and in the meantime, you buy a new player here, you buy a new, uh, 
this is not considered a good thing, actually is considered an aggravating circumstances. Then, and this is the funny part in my personal view of the case, the club as a defense said, we could not, we don't want to pay this fine of 25,000 because we have 14 other proceedings uh, going on against us. Imagine we have to pay 14 times 25,000, we go bankrupt. What is interesting is that the panel says, uh, sorry, this is not an excuse because whether you have one case or another is not important. And this is my only small criticism to the panel. It's not only an, an, an excuse. For me, these are aggravating factor. If a club is, has 14 other debtors also on the line asking for my money, it shows a little bit a pattern of behavior of that club. So my personal advice will be to a club, if you did not pay, you cannot excuse yourself saying I'm a bad payer also with other with other case. It is in the case of course immaterial, but in the merits irrelevant, but I found that quite interesting. And then the deduction of point and the registration ban, the panel said, well, actually, these sanctions, the club had in the end the possibility to avoid them because in the decision of if it is said, you have 60 days to pay. If you don't pay within 60 days, then these two additional sanctions will come up. So how can you club claim that these sanctions are too much if you were yourself responsible or you have the possibility to, decide, to avoid these sanctions? So uh, in other words, the appeal is rejected and the decision of FIFA is confirmed. Here, my takeaway, take away, the FIFA disciplinary power has increased and also has increased in, in efficiency. Basically, it is quite important for a club to pay the debts, otherwise the consequences can be quite substantial. And keep in mind, the new Article 15 looks very similar to the Article 64 of the old code, but is quite different and opens a new door, which for practitioner may be quite important. Now, the last case, uh, very quickly, is a quite uh, small case. And again, for me, it's one of uh, maybe the one that I will ask you not to forget, because in the private, uh, in, in, uh, in normal life, this is probably one of the most important one. It's about a case, uh, is of course a Latin American derby between Argentina and Brazil. We have a Cruzeiro uh, from uh, Belo, Horizonte, Belo Horizonte, from Brazil, and Independiente from Argentina. They conclude an agreement in relation with the player Matias Pisano. So far, so good. Uh, the transfer fee in the agreement is uh, supposed to be paid in three rates, in three installments. Cruzeiro pays only the first rate. So the first rate is paid, second and third are not paid, and therefore, of course, Independiente is not happy. And they go where? Well, they go first to FIFA and then to CAS. And what is interesting here, we leave aside the procedure because the procedure is quite banal, not, uh, nothing special. Let's look at the merits. Why Cruzeiro did not pay? I mean, why they say they did not pay? They say they did not pay because in the transfer agreement, there is an interesting article 2.4 that reads as follows. Independiente shall send Cruzeiro a proper invoice covering each of the payments with its, with its respective bank details. And Cruzeiro says, I'm sorry, we did not receive the invoice and therefore we did not pay. And the, and the matter, even if it looks and sounds funny, it happens very often at CAS. And I think really this is quite an important decision that maybe um, will, go, will go forgotten otherwise. So FIFA, uh, Prestetos decided that Cruzeiro has to pay. Uh, Cruzeiro appeals to CAS and now the CAS decision. First, CAS takes uh, knowledge that the two installments, installment number two and number three are due and are undisputed. Cruzeiro is not saying I did not pay because I should not pay. So this is starting point. Second starting point, Cruzeiro never requested uh, Independiente to send the invoice. Now it is true that in under, under Article 2.4, it is said Independiente shall send the invoice, but the, the CAS panel starts to look at first point, first step, they did not ask, Cruzeiro did not ask. And then, and I think this is probably the most important part, 
what are the main obligations of the parties in this agreement? Well, Independiente, the main obligation is to execute the transfer of Pisano, basically terminating its own employment contract with Pisano, going to the TMS, file the fact that the, the player can go, ITC, blah, blah, blah. That's it. The main obligation of Cruzeiro is to pay the three installment. And of course, then start put again the new employment agreement, TMS, blah, blah, blah. But the two main obligation is basically, I make possible the transfer of the player to you, and you pay me the money. These are the two, sorry, Adrian. These are the two obligations that are one against the other. The obligation under 2.4 to submit the invoice is only of accessory <coughs> or secondary nature. It's not a main obligation. And therefore, for this reason, the panel says, the principle of do ut des, I give you so that you give to me as well, so the, reciproc the recipro reciprocity is not important here. Because the main, what is recipro reciprocal is the paying of money and the transfer of the player, and not this accessory obligation. So Article 82 of the Swiss Code of Obligations, Swiss law here, was applicable in addition to, of course, the FIFA rules, is not applicable in this case. Based on this reason, the panel reject the appeal of uh, Cruzeiro. In addition, and this is my personal point, well, it is interesting to see that Cruzeiro knew very well the bank details of Independiente because in the TMS, the bank details were inserted. Second, Cruzeiro paid the first installment. And, the, and if you can pay the first installment, well, it is rather difficult to say, I did not know how to pay the second and the third. These two additional arguments, for me, look a little bit of a lack of good faith and could have helped or even, let's say, supported even more the decision of the panel. They go basically in the same direction. Take away the conditions that are put on a debtor to be entitled to withhold a payment are quite high. You cannot withhold the payment of a, let's say, second installment or third installment just because you don't like the color of the shoes of the pair the Monday, or if you don't have the bank account that you had, you used maybe three months before to do the first installment. So if you want, if you want really to say, do ut des, I don't perform because you are not performing, there must be a certain level of reciprocity in these two obligations. <coughs> and it is also true, however, and this is the difficult part that we cannot solve, it is up to you in your real work to so try to find solution. It is true that in some cases, to know the bank account and to have a proper invoice can be, can be damned important. And there are some countries where it is indeed difficult to pay out of the country without a certain kind of form, without a certain kind of invoice and so on. But if this is the case, well then first, you have to put a very clear contractual rule in the agreement saying what happens if I don't receive the invoice and so on and so on, the right to suspend the payment and so on and so on. And then you have also as a debtor to have a consistent behavior <coughs> because if it is important, it must be important from day one to day 100. It cannot be that the invoice and the bank account are not important for the first payment, the second payment, and all of a sudden becomes important for the third payment. Because frankly, if this is the case, it is obvious that you, you did not want to pay because you did not have the money or you wanted to save some money or so. And now we come <clears throat> quite in time to the last conclusion. Um, this time I keep short. I think looking at these decisions and, uh, and um, many others that I was not able to choose, I think that increase of quality of the legal work at all levels is quite impressive. Um, personally, I found uh, very often when I, I started to read decisions and I, I start of course by the facts and I don't know who is winning, I think very often, and it sounds terribly stupid, I know, but the party was right normally wins. Basically, if you are wrong, it's quite difficult to win. And I don't want to say that this happened 20 years ago. 
But I tend to believe that nowadays it is more, it is easier to get justice if you are a good lawyer and if you have right. And I, I, I found that quite interesting, even though it is maybe a totally stupid remark. I'm not talking about football played on the pitch. I know that on the pitch always the, the wrong club wins, at least in some countries. But, uh, and Jacopo and, and Turin know very well what I'm referring to. But in law, maybe this is the, the case. Now, uh, we know, and Emilio already mentioned, uh, we have now new rules coming up with the ADD, with the anti-doping chamber at CAS. We have uh, the new rules of the FIFA player stations, the, the RSTP coming on. So new rules will certainly give us new material to think about, to fight about. And I remember I wrote this sentence also two years ago, but I, I said, I said the same here. We will be asked as arbitrators to apply the new rules as good as we can, and, uh, and we apply simply the rules that we are, we are given. And of course, you can help us, if we are acting as arbitrator, to help applying the rules as good as possible. So on this, I, I'm quite sure these new rules will give us new materials for future conferences, and therefore, I hope we'll be here in two years, more or less. Thank you very much. And that's it. Gracias, Miquel. Vamos con algunas preguntas. ¿Quién empieza? Vamos allá a la izquierda. We need, we need a microphone here in the mid. Mr. Loisos okay. from Cyprus. Está ahí en medio, vale. Okay. Hello, Miguel. I have two questions. Okay. The first one is how widely can the term the player's new club be interpreted? And uh, in particular, does the term the player's new club refer only to the club which actually signed and registered the player? Or can it be also applied to a club which following the player's bridge, it actually had the player training with, with it and uh, even playing in friendly matches of this uh, club for a significant amount of time, even though it has later decided not to sign the player? Can this club also be considered as a player's new club? This one question. And the second one is about the 15.1 um, of article of the disciplinary code. It speaks anyone who owns, a, who has to pay another person, brackets, such as a player, coach, or club, brackets close. And does this mean that 15.1 excludes the other parties which are applicable to, on to whom apply the disciplinary regulations apply. For example, are intermediaries excluded? These are my questions. Okay. <clears throat> okay, first, uh, the first question, um, I start with an example. Let's say a player goes from club A to club B and then to club C, and to club B is only trained a little bit and so on, and then he goes to club C. I think new club is the club which, uh, in, in, the, in the meaning of 17.2, can be both B or C. It depends on the circumstances of the case. If club C is from the day one, actually the first club is, is taking profit by, of the breach of the player, and they try to put club B in front to protect themselves, well, then this will not help. And that part of the Mutu case, uh, we, if you look at the decision, they say something about the fact that the player Mutu was, after Chelsea, moved to um, Livorno and then to Juventus. So it, it, is, uh, it can be both. If it is a genuine transfer to club B, and then club B decides generally, okay, no, actually I'm not interested to the player, they transfer a player to C, and they maybe get an even transfer fee from club C, then club C is rather similar to Smuha, 
is not taking profit of the breach of the prayer. So I believe that the answer is the new club that can be sanctioned of joint and several liability is the one that is taking profit more or less directly from the breach of the prayer. But any mechanism to protect him, yourself or to avoid the sanction also will not, uh, will not allow you to, 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 to solve this. Uh, in relation with Article 15, I think it is important to, uh, to look at the fact that the wording goes to who has to pay and who has to do something. So it's not so much about the claimant, it's not about so much the person that goes to FIFA and asks a disciplinary measure to be taken, it's about against whom those disciplinary measures should be taken. And yes, according to the current disciplinary code, those are the people that can be sanctioned on the basis of Article 15. You may have other persons, individuals, entities that can be sanctioned on the basis of other articles of the disciplinary code or the ethics code, and it may be that under the new agents' regulations still to come, that there may be a change there, but for the moment, Article 15 applies on the respondent side, only on the people, in my view, only on the people mentioned in that, in that provision. But it's my view is, uh, of course, there are no jurisprudence yet on that. Okay. Excuse me, Michele. Right. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Let's continue with another example. Exact, ex okay. If I am the player and another club induced me to breach the contract, then the ch player changes advice and signed with a new club. You have no relation with the inducement with the breach. So I have one player. This is a club. I want to s sign with this player. Is is induced the player to breach his contract, then the player changes his advice, and the player sign with a new club, with just with a new one club, does he ignore anything about the first breach. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fabio. I think, uh, again, um, uh, it's not black and white. Um, if the new club, uh, let's say if the third club does, is not aware of the breach, uh, then is not taking any profit out of the breach, um, then you, can, you have some arguments to say why that club should be uh, li joint and several liable. I have a little bit of difficulties if the bad club, the, the one that induced the breach, is not getting any kind of, of sanction. And here, I, I thank you for the question. I take the opportunity to go back to the, to the case of, of the Ghana player and Ismail. What Ismail could do is, of course, to go against the, the club and saying, well, you promised me a, a, a player, we had a contract, you did not fulfill the contract. So that breach is something that uh, Ismail could do, so they have a kind of protection. In your case, if it is only a bad club tries to, as certain clubs make, just trying to make bad, uh, bad noises to, to more to, to give a penalty to another club, Maybe, maybe other sanctions could be possible, but I don't believe that the 17.2 would apply to the innocent, with a totally innocent club, assuming such clubs exist. Next question. Your um, final, the end of your last answer, it's into the question I was going to ask um, about Asante Kotoko, because that is my home country. I'm from Ghana. You said that the club, which is Ismail, could have taken on Kotoko for breach of the contract between them. I was going to ask if there is any provision under the law as it stands now that would have accommodated the action by Ismail against Kotoko. Yes, yes. It, uh, a transfer agreement was concluded between these two clubs. So the Ghana club concluded an agreement with the Egyptian club. They breached the agreement, they did not fulfill, and uh, yes, uh, the Egyptian club could file for compensation for damage. The problem for the Egyptian club is that where is their damage? Uh, because in a way, they saved the money. They did not have to pay salary to this new player. They did not have to pay the transfer fee. What did they lose? Some time sending some emails. That would be the factual difficulty for, for the Egyptian club. 
the left. Hello. Uh, my question is regarding the first case, the Ghana case, again, Article 17.2, where you discussed about the fact that the new club is jointly liable. Now, the question is, in this case, the new club was not at all aware of the earlier offer that was made. And I think uh, many situations like this keeps happening. How do you think this can be avoided? Because it's very unfair on the new club to become a part of an unnecessary dispute when they were unaware of the situation. So one thing I can understand, do a proper diligence on the player and the existing club. But apart from that, do you think is it possible that once the offer is accepted, you have a 48-hour window to let the world know about it so that if anybody has got an objection, they put it out there so that you are clear of such disputes? Or any other way you think of to avoid the situations? Okay, I th uh, very good question. I think the lazy answer is to solve this problem, you have to probably uh, change the rules. Uh, because at the moment, the rules are as they are. Um, in terms of practitioner, um, if a club in that position would ask me, what should I do? I would say, well, either you take the risk and you may be joint and solid uh, several liable, or you find an agreement with a former club. And the end is maybe better to pay a transfer fee, even though the player had breached already the agreement, or is about to breach, or may have breached, or whatever. Maybe it's better to pay a transfer fee, but not incur the risk of disciplinary measure, because remember, it is not only about the joint or several liability of the compensation, but it's also the risk of disciplinary measure if the breach is in the protected period. So my, my I, I, th I think that the, the answer is threefold. Either you take the risk or you do a transfer agreement and this is solved, or we find a way to amend the rules, solving a little bit this problem, which is a problem, of course. It is also a problem for the player. We know the player that breached the agreement, he believes with just cause and is trying to find a new club, but has this kind of uh, guillotine on his head. Uh, it, it, is, it is indeed not a, not a very easy position. Now we are over time. Time is up. Okay. I just maybe the last one. The last question. Michele, Daniel Cravo. Uh, Michele, uh, first of all, I'm 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 going to be a little bit partial in this because uh, I was defeated as a lawyer of a club in the position of Sion in your example. Okay, but on the other hand, the same club, Internacional, might be the creditor in many other situations because we form more clubs than we buy players, uh, players than clubs. Okay, so this is. My concern in that case, and it's a more, a more relief now that I know that I was not the only one that lost a case within this, uh, this context. But on the other hand, my concern is bigger because there are more cases on that. And if we realize that the segmentation uh, uh, principle was created by the CAS wisely to protect the owner of the definitive rights of the player, that, that was the, the reason behind the creation of, and, and you, I think you explored that in previous editions of this Congress for Lausanne. This is point one. It's a, in pragmatical terms, what's gonna happen is that it's gonna be very difficult to a player that was in many loans exactly because maybe he was struggling to consolidate his career, and possibly in that situation of Sion, if he was released for free, for free, Possibly, he will not in the future find a club to play because the club will have to be concerned about possible clubs that he played in the past as a loan. So I think it's, it's very sensitive, this situation. But most than that, other part of the jurisprudence that you know is, is that in the past, clubs charge for a transfer fee and then one year later charge the training compensation, the same selling club, which was not in really good faith, in my point of view. So now it's a kind of contradictory, I'm sorry, uh, that a club that is selling a player, because in our case, Elas Verona charge training compensation, which is a part related to the transfer fee, and in addition to that, charge soli uh, solidarity contribution. So what's gonna happen is that if you are closing a deal in the last day, you as a buying club, you're gonna have to ask for the release of any and all previous clubs. And that will, in detriment of the player's career also. But just to finish, and rep sorry, just one more comment, one more comment. It's not entirely true that a club that engage a player on a loan is not interested at all in forming the player. 
the club that engages the player on a loan wants the player to play. So there's not the same sense that you use when you, you release the player on a loan where, or when you get the player on. So the question is, considering that this decision is not in line with the wording of the article because it said the last club, singular, and has to deny the, 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 uh, um, the validity of the, the other rule that says with the loans, the effects as, of loans as definitive transfers, should we not change these rules to make it more clear? Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, again, two, two answers. The first one, the lazy one, absolutely, we should change the rules. Uh, I think the rules are on the revision and Emilio will tell us that train compensation and solidarity are part of it and also the mechanism of the payment uh, may be different quite soon or hopefully soon. Um, however, only 30 seconds to say, I'm not entirely convinced that the decision is against what everything has been said before or against the rules. It is true that the, the wording for my club is not the same and it's true that it's uh, only one club and the decision now speaks of two clubs. But there are other principles that are confirmed by this decision. First, that only the club where the player is, and therefore the club that effectively trains the player, has the right to training compensation. Second, the club who has a player in loan, it is not true necessarily that you will find less clubs able or willing to take players in loan, because they know now that even if the player is in loan with them, they may have a training compensation uh, uh, claim. Third, it is not that by every transfer of this world you will have to go back to the prehistory of the player. Here we are talking about a transfer that happens immediately after a player came back from loan and then was transferred. This is quite important. The player from Genoa went back to Krasnodar. He did not travel back to Russia, probably. He stayed at home and then was transferred to Sion. So he did not play anymore with Krasnodar. But since he was alone, he went back and then went forth. And this is, I mean, for me, a quite specific situation. And therefore, I don't think that this decision, even if the rules do not change, will mean a dramatic, uh, will have a dramatic negative impact on the loan of players. At least, I hope so. Okay. Thank you. Again. Thank you very much.